everybody. We are live, and by live, I mean live in Chicago, and live over the internet airwaves uh, via live stream. You are, along with me, very privileged to be in a conversation with Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Big, big thanks to our sponsors, Final Draft, when you need to put, to always have the last word, Final Draft. <laughs> that is not, that is not who they are. All right, I didn't, I just made that up. We just had a great session with you a couple hours ago and we got sort of the, the backstory and it's amazing. Who doesn't know all the amazing things this guy has done? In the Heights, did a little polish on West Side Story and working. <laughs> Um, and like the most fun show I've seen in a very long time, Bring It On, and you may not know, he is the secret weapon behind the Tony Awards. All those fun numbers that everybody raves about how great Neil Patrick Harris is. <laughs> this man, doing it on the fly. A lot of help, a lot of help. Every time I watch, I'm like, oh, how did you do that? So you're gonna tell us today. Sure. All right, cool. We're gonna start at- This vodka's amazing. <laughs> We're gonna start in the middle. We, don't, we know where you came from. I wanna know, what are you doing now? What's got you on fire? Um, right now? <laughs> Besides uh, this. Uh, 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 Luminati's deep dish pizza has me on fire uh, <laughs> right now here in Chicago. Um, but I am I'm pretty single-mindedly working on uh, this Hamilton musical that I've been working on for about four years now. Um, I've been writing it since I was still in Heights, um, writing backstage uh, when I read this amazing biography uh, by Ron Chernow about the guy on the $10 bill and, uh, and just fell in love, it just, his life story resonated with so many of the things I wanted to write about. Um, and it was this um, sort of side of history I really knew nothing about. I knew he got shot by the vice president, but I mean, you know, Dick Cheney shot a guy while he was vice president, <laughs> like, that's a thing. Um, that's nothing new. Um, and so, but I just, I fell in love with his story and, um, and I've been working on it for the past um, uh, four years. And we just did a reading up at New York Stage and Film uh, at Vassar. And, uh, and sort of presented what we had, which was uh, one act and three songs in act two. There are 30 songs in act one. Um, it's, a, it's a sung through, it's, a, it's, it's become a sung through uh, and wrapped through show. Um, and so that's, that's my life right now. If with, you don't mind, me, if you don't like mind me delving, yeah? what's the conceit? How are you taking history and putting it in a contemporary form? Without giving too much away, I'm 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 just doing what everyone else who writes musicals is doing. Um, I'm 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 uh, finding a musical vocabulary to tell this story. Um, for me, hip hop seems like the only way to tell Alexander Hamilton's story because he is um, <laughs> he is. The <laughs> I know you think that's funny. I really don't. Um, I, um, because it's, it's, it's a story about words, and it's a story about using words to save your life and destroy your life. Uh, this is a guy who pulled himself out of his circumstances because he wrote a poem about an, uh, a hurricane that had decimated St. Croix, where he was living. He was 14 years old. He wanted to be anywhere but where he was. He wrote a letter to a friend. The first letter we have from Hamilton says, um, you know, I know I am said to be building sand castles in the air, but we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. I will conclude by saying that I wish there was a war. Um, this is an intense 14 year old. Um, <laughs> and this hurricane destroys the island and he writes a poem about, about the damage. And the, the poem gets used as a way to raise money for relief funds. Um, and people take up a collection to send him to the mainland to get his education, because he's all self-taught. He's reading what he can, where he can. He out Dickens is any Dickens character you know. Um, and he um, makes himself indispensable to George Washington because he can write really quickly in English and in French, and, um, and becomes Washington's aide de camp. All the while, he's lugging books through the Revolutionary War, boning up on monetary history because he knows it's, we're going to need it because the currency we made up is worthless and um, we're losing because British troops 
uh, Americans are helping British troops over the revolution because their money means something and ours doesn't. Um, this fear of chaos and, 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 and basically makes himself indispensable to Washington. He also thinks he's the smartest guy in every room he's in. So he makes enemies of pretty much everybody else. Um, because So there's the Constitutional Congress, right? And we're deciding what kind of government we want to have. Hamilton says, this plan is great, and if this is the plan, that's fine. But I have my own idea, and it's five, five uh, houses of government, and holds forth for six hours his own version of what the American government should look like. Half the room goes, this kid is a genius. Half the room, Ben Franklin's sitting in there, someone going, who is this? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we see him sort of make and destroy his career by, by his own sort of strength of speech and strength of character. Cool. And that to me is Tupac. Yeah. Um, it's, it's this just relentless torrent of words, some of which are incredible, but also this massive contradiction. Some of his songs are, you know, these be a beautiful ode to his mother like Dear Mama, then the next one will be Hit Him Up where he takes out every other rapper working saying, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Um, and, um, and these contradictions are, are all in Hamilton too. Sounds amazing, I can't wait. Now, you are, you're driving this. Do you have co-conspirators? I do. Um, I, I, I have been working with Tommy Kale, who directed uh, In the Heights. And um, you know, I was working very much by myself, um, and uh, I was writing at the frantic pace of a song a year. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Tommy heard, I played Tommy what I had written so far, and he said, there's no reason you shouldn't be writing this faster. And like we did on Heights, we started just setting these deadlines. And, and it's been a very weird road with Hamilton because we kind of showed everyone the ultrasound before there was any hint of a baby. Like in the top of the first trimester, you know, I performed this, the first song from the show at the White House and that's become its own viral YouTube thing. That that's was the great. only thing I had written. Um, and that was the first public performance of it. Um, but the White House called and said, we're doing this evening of spoken word poetry. Uh, you can do something from In the Heights if you want, but do you have anything on the American experience? And I had a hot 16 about Hamilton. That was all I had. <laughs> and, and so it was, and I just felt like, well, what better place to debut something um, that's about, about this country? And so, um, you know, that went viral in its own way. I've, I've talked to lots of teachers who use that in their classroom. Um, and, and, and to, to prep them for their American history seminars. And, and, and I just want to say, wait, 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 that's, that's just the first song in the show. Um, so so I'm, you know, I've just been uh, doing my best to, to sort of finish it. And so we, you know, New York Stage and Film was one benchmark. And um, we're continuing to set deadlines so that we have a, a, a show hopefully by next year. Nice. Now, did you put that out there to light a fire to say, I'm doing this and it's out in the world now and now I have to finish it? I honestly, I, a couple of weird, yes, in one sense. Um, but I didn't know, for instance, that HBO filmed that evening. Um, they were following two of their poets who were also performing, and that's why that footage looks like it's out of some surreal movie about my life, as opposed to just like stock footage of a White House performance. It's HBO edited and put it together and, and put it online. I didn't know that was gonna happen going in. I just knew that I think the president will like this. Um, and I didn't know anything else sort of going in. So that was all sort of a happy accident. But, um, but yes, I, I, I very much need deadlines to write. Um, and, and with this one, the deadlines have all been weirdly public, um, which is scary, uh, you know, because it's, people have known about it a long time and um, you know, you wanna, you wanna live up to that. But at the same time, it's, it's just the way this one is, you know, some pregnancies are difficult, some pregnancies are like, oh, I'm, pre I'm in my third trimester and I just found out I was pregnant. Um, and this one is, this one's just been really, po I started showing really early and that's just what it is. <laughs> so you kind of just have to go with it. <laughs> I don't think we've talked about collaboration a lot. Um, you obviously have some people you trust. How did you find them? How did you, how did you, when did you know? I was, ve I was very lucky to find Tommy Kale early, early in my career, at the dawn of my career, really. Um, so I started writing Heights as a, uh, most people know this, so I'm gonna say it quick. But um, I started writing Heights as a project in school, in college, and um, I had a recording of that and a script um, and two kids who were seniors at the time, Neil Stewart and John Mailer, uh, Norman Mailer's youngest son, 
um, saw that show and were committed to starting their own theater company when they moved to New York, which was going to be that year. Um, I went on and I put In the Heights in a drawer and kept writing and acting and stuff through college. Um, and they started that company with Tommy Kale. So Tommy had two years of listening to my college version of In the Heights um, on his own and making notes, and he was aware of it before I was aware of him. Um, and True to their word, the week I graduated, they got in touch with me and said, We'd we're still interested in Heights. Um, you know, happy graduation, <laughs> come meet us. We've built a, um, we're building a black box theater in the basement of the drama bookshop. The Arthur Seeland Theater, which is down there, uh, was the storeroom. And they basically said, hey, we'll turn this into a theater and you can have all the money from it if we can have a clubhouse, um, which was very smart of them. And, um, and so I was in there when it was still just a storeroom. And, uh, and Tommy, with two years of wanting to talk to me, but I, I, I don't know why he didn't talk to me, um, sort of said, uh, Usnavi's an interesting character, but he's only in two scenes. He could be your narrator, because all, all the stories go through his store. Uh, and Washington Heights is a really cool song, but it's third, it should be first, it establishes your world. And, and sort of hit, you know, hit me with where, and again, this is where time is your friend and everything has to happen at the right time. If he had said that to me after my sophomore year, after having just seen it, I would have said, this is a crazy person um, and I think I've written the best thing possible because at that point in my life, I had. I'd sort of put everything I know into it. When he came at me with all his ideas, I said, one, this guy is really smart and is all of his ideas would make this show better. And two, I had two years of distance and perspective. And, and, and I'm sure you have all learned this, but there's the thing of when you let someone in to see your work and when you let um, someone say it, because you, you let them in too soon and they say something and that kind of kills the thing. Um, it's, 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 it's really to be protected. And um, I had the benefit of two years distance on the show. It had been sitting in a drawer. And so I was really ready to hear any and all ideas on how to make it better. And, and I knew this guy was the guy to get me there. And that, that conversation that started the week after I graduated continued another six years um, And as, as we worked through the show. And again, you know, we were very lucky to find producers that take chances on new work. Kevin and Jeffrey have sort of made a career out of finding the Jonathan Larsons and Bobby Lopez and Jeff Marks of the world who have, you know, they're untested, but they have a good idea and they're willing to work hard and, and, and getting behind that. And they, and they found us and Tommy proving himself every step of the way because, you know, a lot of times you'll be paired with a more experienced director and, and Tommy just kept proving himself every time he had the chance to direct a piece. So he, he came along with the work uh, because he added value to it. Um, he was really a, uh, an unofficial dramaturg. And uh, when Kiara came on board in 2004, um, helped us all triangulate and you know did the thing that you hear John Kander and Fred Ebb say about um, how Prince, when he's directing their shows, you talk and you talk and you talk until you're all writing the same show. Um, and and that's, that's when musicals go off the rails, when the music and, and the story don't necessarily match. Or, you know, this person wanted to write this and, and they've made a Frankenstein instead of a beautiful thing. Um, and so, um, you know, to Tommy's really good at that. And, uh, and so he's been uh, a really indispensable ally uh, in that respect. Nice. Now, when you were working it through and developing. I'm sure that what these producers weren't the, weren't the only opportunity. No. Nope. Who did you have to say no? Don't, not naming names, but tell me about saying no to somebody that you were like, this is the biggest mistake, or I know I make, I'm, even though everybody's telling me it's the biggest mistake, I know I'm. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I mean, I could, I could name producers that you know uh, who said, you know, uh, it's a really strong musical vocabulary, but we got to up the stakes. And up the stakes, if you're dealing with Latino show, is make Nina pregnant or involve a drug, some kind of drug plot. Because that's what the producers who were talking to me see on the news when they hear about Washington Heights. They don't hear the good stories that come from Washington Heights. They hear about the bad stuff on the crime blotter. Um, and, and really, um, not only uh, producers, but, but composers um, who, who saw the work um, w would say the exact same thing. Where are the stakes? Where are the, um, where are the drugs? Where are the, where's the crime? Um, which no one says to Woody Allen when he's doing his New York. Um, <laughs> I, I've been mugged once, and it was on the Upper East Side in Woody Allen's New York. Um, <laughs> So I don't, I don't know what that's about. Uh, well, I know exactly what it's about. 
Um, and so, um, you know, what, what Kevin and Jeffrey are really good about doing is, 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 is saying, write the best version of your show, and this is what doesn't work for us, but they're, they're very rarely prescriptive. They don't say, you need a prostitute. They don't say, you need this in act two. What they say is, this works, this works, this works, this doesn't work, fix it. Um, and then trust us to fix it and, and make it better and tell us what they think is missing. And, um, and it's very collaborative uh, in that sense. And again, Tommy being great about uh, writing the world. And, and then also finding Kiara, who was writing these beautiful plays about her family and her community in Northern Philly. Um, so that was also a really great marriage because she, um, she doesn't shy away from any of the complications of, of Latino immigrant life uh, in these uh, struggling neighborhoods, um, but but she also finds the beauty and truth of it. And if you're writing from a place of love, um, you know, writing about this neighborhood um, is it, it, it can be a joyful thing. And that's that's what I think. I think that's what people take away from the show is um, people have this feeling of I, I either long for a community like that or I relate to one of these characters because um, somewhere along the line, um, whether it was me or whether it was a parent or a grandparent, someone sacrificed so I could do better um, or I'm killing myself so that my kid can do better. I think that is something a any parent or child can relate to and we deal with various iterations of that story all, all through um, the plot of Heights. Now, was your goal always to be in the show? No. Um, I, I always did Usnavi. I did Usnavi in all of the readings um, and workshops because it was just the heaviest lifting and it was the most to teach. So it made Tommy's job easier for me to play Usnavi and then charmingly tiptoe around the plot holes or whatever we hadn't solved yet uh, as the writer uh, while we... Um, while we focused on, on, on the other actors and, and, and getting them sort of involved in the world, the way Tommy put it was like, you'll play Usnavi for now, we'll get a real actor later. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's fine. And, um, and, and that's fine because, you know, as you can see from my manic public energy, that's, that's you know, it works. It works for the character. Um, and so... Um, you know, when we, when we met Kevin and Jeffrey, you know, Kevin, I was still writing, I was still doing book music and lyrics at this point, and it was becoming an operetta because I know how to solve problems musically. I know how to solve dramatic problems musically. That's my, that's my thing that I'm good at. When it becomes dialogue, it's like all efficiency leaves, and I don't have that gift, and Kiara very much has that gift. And so... Um, you know, Kevin has said two, th you know, here's Kevin, producer of Rent, producer of Avenue Q, which is in previews at this point in 2003. And he says, I don't know what this story is, and I don't think you do either, but I love the musical language, and I like you as that guy. Um, and so I sort of fell in the snowball as it rolled down the hill. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah. And, and I'd always acted and written in equal measure, in high school and in college. I'd always, I, I, I'd write a show every year, but I would also act in other people's things, because it just helped my writing. Like, they, they feed each other. I mean, they're two sides of the same coin. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, you know, getting the, the stage manager who doesn't want to be on stage and shoving him on stage. I, I had experience, but it was, a, you know, a very happy accident. <laughs> well, yeah, happy for us. <laughs> no, I mean. Who's, who's seen In the Heights? Who's seen it three times? <laughs> All right. Um, one of my beloved childhood experiences you got a chance to, to get involved with and just refresh it so much delight to, to revisit Electric Company. Oh, yeah. You've got to <laughs> talk about that. Oh, well, sure. I mean, that was great. Like, I... I mean, I grew up with Electric Company too, and you know, in in my house, Rita Moreno was a patron saint. Um, so uh, the fact that uh, we got asked, um, it was not just me, but um, this this hip hop improv group I'm involved with. We were sort of involved in the creation of the first test pilot, um, and then we didn't, we weren't as involved as the show became what it is and moved forward, the revamped Electric Company. Um, but we still got called on to write songs. Bill Sherman, who did the or 
uh, co-orchestrations for In the Heights was the musical director. So he would call and say, we need, we need four songs. There's a rap about hard G and soft G, uh, a song about silent E, and, uh, and, and they're a joy to write. Uh, and, and now he's a music director at Sesame Street. So you know, I write a song or two a year uh, when Bill calls me and says, uh, we got a, Grover has to rap about uh, being friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so he calls me, and, I, and, it's, and it is a joy. The best, the best thing, and this is like one of those things that unexpected gifts that happen because of the circumstances, when you write for Sesame Street, they send you this PDF that is the vocal ranges of all of the Muppets. So, oh. like, Grover can't sing above a D and can't sing a below, a, you know, a, a middle C, uh, whereas, you know, Big Bird has this range and you can't write one note outside of that range. And it's super fun um, to, to sort of the challenge of, like, man, I gotta write for over. Um, and so um, anytime those assignments come up, I'm, I'm happy to sort of put everything to the side and write them. Would you give us a little demo, maybe? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm trying to think of one that was uh, I have a piano here. Oh. But um, there's a, a Silent E is a Ninja is the one I wrote the fastest. And that is the one that most people's kids know. Um, and it's about the fact that E, <laughs> e jumps on the ends of words. and. Uh, and changes the pronunciation. It was like, Silent E is a ninja. Silent E is a ninja. I didn't notice when he came. I cannot accept any praise or blame. And then it just like goes on to like all these words. <laughs> and then like the E comes in, changes the meaning, that gets like escapes. Um, so that's that for some reason. I, I was walking my dog in the park uh, about a month ago, and this kid started following me, this like 13 year old kid. And I finally stopped and said, Hi. And he said, Silent E is a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I went, where'd he go? Where'd he go? And he was like, where, where, where'd he go? And walked the other way. It was great. It was great. Now, you used to teach. Mm -hmm. Do you miss it? I do. Um, my, my first job out of college was teaching seventh grade English at my old high school. And uh, I taught, uh, and it was fantastic because I had just gotten out of there. I was, it was four years uh, in college, and then I'm back in my school. All my teachers are there, and and suddenly you're at drinks after parent-teacher conferences with your teachers, um, <laughs> which is great because some of them are much cooler than you thought they were when you were a student, and some of them are just as crazy as you thought they were, uh, even crazier. Um, so that was uh, enormously fun. But what I what I loved most about it um, is is that moment when a kid sort of grasps an idea and wraps their head around it. And it's sort of, it, my learning curve on teaching was it's the opposite of performing, actually. A lot of people think it's this performative thing. But when you're really doing your job as a teacher, you're talking very little. You're prodding just enough to get the kids engaged with each other. Um, and you're just kind of keeping the ball in the air when, when the volleyball goes to the side. Um, and and the, the learning curve from, hi, I'm Lynn Miranda, I'm your teacher, to like really just sort of lobbing a question and just fi watching them um, um, engage each other and, and, and sort of tease out what they're, what they're learning in discussion um, was a real joy. So I, you know, I, was, uh, I was asked to, to, to do it again the second year. You know, I did it for a year, uh, and they asked me to come back, and it was one of those, I could see myself being very happy doing this for the rest of my life, so I'm going to stop right now, because uh, I don't want to Mr. Holland it out, um, <laughs> and, and think about what might have been, and I took the much scarier road of being like a broke writer for a very long time, and substituting uh, being a professional sub at Hunter for a long time, but also just doing whatever I had to do to pay rent. Wow. Let's have some questions. It's your time, guys. Yeah. Hit me. Somebody, anybody. We've got a microphone. We're recording this, so if you don't mind stepping up. Uh, <coughs> Hi. Um, I'm a big fan of hip hop as well, and I just wanted to ask you kind of what you think about the current state of hip hop music, and also why you feel like it hasn't been more prevalent in musical theater, because you see some, but not a, not a lot, and it feels like they're very complementary forms. Just kind of what you think about the intersection of those yeah, two things. Yeah, I, 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 that's a great question. And I, I agree with you that they're complementary forms. I think the things I love best 
about hip hop music are, are some of the things I like best about musical theater, which is sometimes this, this verbal dexterity that takes you to this other emotional place. Um, and when married with the right music, transports you. Um, I think that's what musical theater and hip hop do best, and they both do it best. Um, you know, in terms of the current, I think, and I'm sh I hope you agree, that the music that you end up writing resembles the music that mattered to you the most when you were a teenager. Because you had the most hormones coursing through your veins, and it's when you just felt the most. And, and so, you know, I, you know I, I, I listen to a lot of uh, modern hip hop, and I listen to what's on the radio, but my heart is in 1993, because I was 13. But that also happened to be a very interesting time for hip hop, because it was, it was sort of the last, it was just before The Chronic came out, um, and when there were number one hits that were not all gangster rap songs. Um, there was PM Dawn, there was Arrested Development, there was A Tribe Called Quest, there was Common. Um, there was this sort of feeling that it could go anywhere, and then The Chronic sort of was such a massive crossover hit that that became the dominant sound um, for a very long time. Not that those other forms didn't still exist, but that was what ruled the radio. Um, I think that um, what's on the radio and what's being made are two very different things. Um, I still think there's a lot of really exciting uh, hip hop. Um, I, you guys are probably not hip to this, but right now in the hip hop world, uh, Kendrick Lamar just released this verse on a mixtape where he names every other rapper and he says, I respect y'all, but I'm trying to murder you with every track I do. Which is really kind of unprecedented in hip hop because I think one of the lessons of the 90s were people would, would take it very personally and, and there, were, there was real physical violence associated with these songs that were being released. And this was a really interesting gauntlet that was thrown down. He said, lyrically, I think you're all great, but I'm trying to be the best. What are you trying to do? And so it made it about lyrical wordplay and rappers started answering the next day with songs. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that because I think that moves the art form forward in a way that's positive. And um, Big Daddy Kane wrote an amazing tweet about it. He said, I love that hip hop is, um, can be a competitive sport. I just don't want it to be a contact sport. Um, and uh, I think that says it perfectly. Um, so, um, but yeah. That's my thoughts on hip hop right now. Very cool. Might be dated in five minutes. Lynn, I have a question. Um, regarding the bilingual aspect of your musical, how much of that, did you have to change anything and did you have to pull anything out from the original or was that ratio of the Spanish-English pretty much the way it was originally presented? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by originally presented. You know, we probably doubled the amount of Spanish between off-Broadway and Broadway. Um, which is sort of an interesting thing because you would, it seems counterintuitive, right? Like, quote unquote, Broadway, uh, quote unquote, Broadway audience, um, make it accessible to everyone. Uh, that being said, another one of the fun things about writing Heights specifically was you're dealing with a bilingual neighborhood. So we get to play with two languages. Um, and I, you know, my, my number one job is to make the audience feel taken care of uh, no matter who they are. So. Generally, even though there's lots of Spanish sections, you're getting the English translation or you're getting the gist of it um, right away. And it's built into the DNA um, of the piece, you know, and, and the fun of trying to rhyme Spanish with English um, and, and, you know, and doing our best to marry those two things and, and, and making that another choice, right? So, you know, the old adage in musicals is when we're feeling too much to speak, we sing, and when we're feeling too much to sing, we dance. And, 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 adding, and adding when we're feeling too much to sing, we rap. And adding when we're feeling too much to sing in English, we sing in Spanish. Um, so, um, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, adding a couple of sides to the die. Um, and, and so that was really fun to play with, you know, contrast that with my work on, on West Side Story, which I was asked to do by, by Arthur Lawrence. And, you know, it's very one thing when, it's one thing when it's built into the DNA of the piece, it's another thing when you're touching a masterpiece that people really like, myself included. Um, I don't think I ever would have un undertaken it um, had it not been the creators of the show themselves being involved. Um, but, you know, we did the experiment, we, I, I, I adapted, I feel pretty, uh, the shark section of the quintet, and um, a boy like that, I have a love. 
And by the end of the Broadway run, Just I Feel Pretty was in Spanish, because the audience was like, why are you messing with our show? Um, and there was a lot of uh, pushback. And I think we assumed everyone knows West Side Story. It's the closest thing to canon, to legend we have. But, but there were a lot of people who wanted to see a production like they had done in their high school or like they had um, experienced in the movie version and, and really didn't want that messed with. And, and I get that. Like, I, I, don't, I don't take any, uh, you know, I don't take it. I don't take it personally. Um, it was an amazing experience to work with those people, and uh, I'd do it all again. But again, whereas something we just accepted with height because it's sort of marbled into the recipe, uh, it's different when you're messing with something people really know and, and really take to heart. But it's on the recording. Yeah, it's on the recording. And you got to hear it. <laughs> it's pretty nuts. Hi, Lynn. I'm, I'm someone who played Maria West Side Story like three times as a little Iowa farm girl. So it's a really special musical to me. And I, I grew up teaching little kids on the farm that someday they could do musical theater too. So I moved to New York City. And I moved to Inwood. And I remember, and this is about 10 years ago, and you're one of my heroes because I'm a musical theater writer. I wrote book lyrics and choreograph and teach just like you. So people in the hood would say, yeah, Lynn's doing a show. I mean, they, they knew of you on the street, Broadway, just you know, where, the, where, where the train and Broadway were all those little shots. On I lived, uh-huh. They were like, yeah, Lynn is gonna be, he's gonna be famous. <laughs> he's gonna be. That's crazy to me. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, I, I can give you their names. Uh, and I'm like, he is gonna be famous. And I saw your first workshop. Oh, fantastic. Of In the Heights. And I'm like, he is gonna be famous. Oh. So I, j I tell your story to lots of, I live in Chicago now. Fantastic. And I just finished my PhD. And I tell people your story that are kids all the time. I'm like, you know what? You can write book, music, and lyric. It might take 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I know there, there's a show. And so you're, you're, you're an example, like lots of people in the room. But I had to tell you that story. And then I got to meet uh, West Side Story Arthur Lawrence yeah. and, got to, and saw the preview of West Side Story. And I said, he's doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll tell you why that story is so crazy to me. You know, when, when Heights came out, there were a lot of sort of news pieces or even Broadway news pieces where they'd say, all right, well, the pitch was always, let's walk around your Washington Heights. Uh -huh. and I was like, okay, if you want. Um, and I yeah. think they expected I'd walk into places and people would be like, oh, snobby, like it is in the show. Right. And that's not, <laughs> I'm not really a Dominican bodega owner. No. I'm a writer, so I'm right. the guy who no one knows. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sitting in the corner with a notepad while other people, while cab drivers are talking and while, you know, while people are, are living their lives, I'm the one who is silent. Yeah. Um, and I think, pe you know, the reporter is always crestfallen, like, I wish you knew more people in this <laughs> I was like, I know them, but they just don't know who I am or what I'm doing here. I'm just sitting in the corner and that's They, they claim you though, so just so you yeah. know, act No, like I'm very proud to claim me. Yeah, I'm very, I, I cool. still live up there, so, you know, yeah. it's nice. Yeah, I go there all. Nice job, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, how you doing? Hi. Um, can you address the true rhyme versus the near rhyme, which you're very yeah, good at? Yeah, sure. Uh, Broadway for decades was all about the true rhyme, and pop music back in the day and the jazz era was all about the true rhyme as well. And then even early rock and roll had the true rhyme, but most pop music, be it uh, R&B or country music or pop or power pop or hip hop, it's the near rhyme is, rhyme is really the art of how yeah. you do that. So, and, but in Broadway, there's these purists, and so how do you work with that? And how do you? And, and also, you're trying to get the the story across, so the true rhyme does help people connect with it. So, how do you how do you work yeah. with that? That's a great so, question. I yeah. touched on it a little bit in the other panel, but I'm really glad you asked it. The purists just don't like me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's a couple of things. I think there are. There are things that people have been handed as lore, right? There is the I want song. There is the 11 o'clock number. And there is this notion that true rhyme is the only rhyme that makes any sense in the theater, which has just been disproven by, by every writer working in the theater. Um, I think there are, um, you know, it's, it, it's really interesting. There, are, there, are, um, there is this sort of feeling that, that, that rhyme denotes intellect, right? You know, there's, Sondheim always complains about his uh, I feel pretty, like how is she doing these Noel Coward-esque uh, internal rhymes? She's an immigrant, um, she's just gotten here. 
and there's, I get that. At the same time, um, there are so many rappers who are doing such incredible things with the English language who do not have a college education. And it's about fun with language. And, and, and through my own personal history um, with, with family members who speak uh, English and Spanish, the fun you can have with syntax and the fun you can have with words, um, it, it, it's so much bigger than a pure rhyme versus not a pure rhyme. And, and, and there is also, you know, what I talked about in the other panel is threading the needle in musical theater, we reward the pure rhyme that lands with a satisfying snap. But, it, but the other half of that that people don't talk about is it's also got to be unexpected. And it's also got to be surprising. And, um, and I think people lose the forest for the trees with that. And, and with hip hop, um, often the unexpected rhyme or the near rhyme is rewarded as, as being outside of the box thinking. And, and um, you know, sometimes it falls flat and sometimes it doesn't. But delivery uh, is a big part of whether it works or not. So with In the Heights, I'm trying to write lyrics that will satisfy uh, a musical theater fan who will say, there's craft here. Um, but also the hip hop fan who says all these rhymes are moon June, um, who thinks true rhyme is actually boring. Um, and, and so um, I was very conscious of that with Heights, of, of, of when to choose my battles, um, when, to, when to do pure rhyme, when to break it, uh, when to do near rhyme. Um, and, and, and it's something I've, I've you know, sort of doubled in intensity on this Hamilton project I'm working on, because there's a lot more hip hop lyrics. Um, and there's a lot more internal assonance. Um, and there's, and there's, um, there's just lots more work. But, but I think people use there's no true rhyme as a shorthand for there's no craft there. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I think that um, you should break the rhyme, but you got to have a damn good reason to do it. Um, and I think that's, that's an important lesson that gets lost in the shuffle of uh, true rhyme or get out. Now so that thus endeth the lesson on true rhyme. <laughs> now you did In the Heights for how many performances? Um, I, perv I did the show the first year. And then I did, uh, I did it in LA and Puerto Rico on the tour, and then I did the last two weeks to close it out. Is there a rhyme that night after night tickled you every time you did it? That you were like, <laughs> come uh, on, fess up. Uh, um, it, well, the first thing that sprang to mind, and again, not, not a pure rhyme, <laughs> um, is uh, uh, me and the GWB uh, thinking, Gee, Nina, what do you be? Um, and uh, I, I just really like the way that sat. It, it said exactly what she needed to say. Um, and um, you know, I, I, I was also in the bodega, so I got to like watch her do it. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. I, I had the perspective of the show for a year as someone inside it, it's, um, which is very different from, from getting to watch your show. Um, so there's, there's whole sections of this show when, when I go to see a student production or someone's invited me to the production, I go, oh, yeah. I was, I was uh, backstage going to the bathroom because that was the only time I could do it. Um, so it's, um, it's fun to, to rediscover the show in that way. Nice. I was just uh, wondering, uh, one of the things I love about the, the Heights score is that it incorporates uh, pop and hip hop genres, but it's still at its core a theatrical score, which is, what's so, which is what I find so interesting about it. And I feel like that's what makes the hip hop aspects, all the rapping, all that, that I feel like that's what makes it work. Uh, I was just wondering, um, I've noticed a trend in some Broadway shows, I can't name any off the top of my head right now, but uh, that sort of, that are heavy on the pop, but not so much on the theatrical. So I was wondering what your advice would be to uh, uh, up and coming uh, composers who want to incorporate pop more successfully in a theatrical score. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the kind of music I write is very much informed by the kind of music I grew up listening to. So that has a contemporary sound to it. I come by it honestly. Um, and I think, um, I think any writer just should come by, by their work honestly, whether they're working in a genre or, or regardless. Like, it's got to come from your kishkas, right? Um, and so, uh, sorry to use Yiddish. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I, I see what you're saying. I think that one of the things that so gets lost in the shuffle and is so, we learn it when we learn Peter and the Wolf in fifth grade, is like every character's got their own rhythm and every character's got their own internal 
combustion engine. And I very much write from that place. When Usnavi enters, he's got an energy and he's got a tempo um, and a musical <coughs> language. And then when he, and then Abuela is like old school Cuban and she's got her tempo and she's got her thing. And when they sing together, those tempos mash together and it makes its own song. It sounds simple, but you'd be amazed um, how many writers um, particularly first-time writers, and so that's why it happens, just sort of throw songs at situations without regard to well, why does he sing like this or why does she sing like that. It's the reason 95% of jukebox musicals don't work. You haven't solved the initial question of why everyone sounds like this catalog, right? Like, why do they all sound like that? You know, Jersey Boys is ingenious because that's, that's the story of their, of their ascendance, um, and it, the music is organically coming out of their, their rise. Um, but you know, I've seen I've seen workshops of I won't name names, but I've seen workshops of cat jukebox musicals of pop catalogs, and it's like, well, why do they all sound like this pop artist whose music you're doing? And it, you haven't answered the central dramatic question: Do we live in a world where he's God, and that's why they all sound like him? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if, if 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 you're choosing this artist, there must be some sort of variety in their work. That okay, you know, this era of this artist's life sounds like this character. Like you've got to do that work of you know the the most the, the, the musicals I love. Like there's that character song, and every time they come in, they've got that energy, and they're bringing it to the story. And that's what people forget. They just sort of throw songs at the story, as opposed to really delving into doing the playwright work of delving into character. How does this person tick, and then how is that expressed musically? That's what's missing. Nice. One more. Oh, uh-oh. Throw down. <laughs> you're the book writer, you're the lyricist, you're the, the composer. Uh, what, uh, what, what comes first when you're in your process? Um, Hamilton is the first thing where I'm, I'm doing all three, and that's because it's sung through. We, um, we actually, Tommy and I went down the road with a playwright for a bit, and we realized there's so much hip-hop and heightened speech that this was going to be a sung through project. And I didn't want to work with a great playwright and not get to hear any of their words. So I sort of took up the mantle of doing all three with this one. And again, if we're extending the pregnancy metaphor to its logical, torturous extreme, um, I, I was already way too pregnant with the show to sort of begin working with another writer on this particular project. Um, it, it always starts with, with character um, and, and with uh, the situation. Um, and then music and lyrics come in when they come in. Um, every, every single song is, is different. And I'll, I'll say my favorite Leonard Cohen quote, which is, you know, being a songwriter is, is like being a nun. You're married to a mystery. Um, and <laughs> your job is to create this thing. And you don't know, you know, at every stage, you don't know what's going to come first. Um, the situation may suggest a, an urgency and a tempo, and you start from the tempo and work backwards. Um, you know, with Bring It On, um, that was set in the world of cheerleading. So, really, I built that score by Andy singing a tempo at me and a and an energy at me and writing down what he did. And Andy's a very, if you know Andy Blankenbuehler, he's a very expressive guy, and it has to feel like ka 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 ka. -ka. And I would write down, <laughs> and I would notate ka 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 ka. -ka. <laughs> at the tempo he spat it at me, that would be the first thing on the page, and i build from that. And he'd go, how'd you know what I wanted? And i go, because I wrote down the gibberish you yelled at me. <laughs> um, and started there. Um, and so it very much felt of a piece with the energy he was trying to bring in. With Heights, we had these, you know, we were trying to figure out how to write a Right, figure out the story, the language, uh, and the characters all at the same time. So it took a longer time because you'd write this great song and it derailed three things in Act Two. It was like a, it was like a twelve-sided Rubik's cube. Um, and uh, and then w with Hamilton, I have this great narrative spine of this guy's life. Um, and the torturous part is is what to omit and and you know what. Um, what, what moves us forward? What, you know, what, this guy is, is, is relentless. Um, he, he lives in turbo, he never stops, he slept three hours a night, and, and he's verbose. So it's like, you gotta fill that machine. So I've been, actually, it's been a lot of Sweeney Todd and Gypsy for me, um, because those are musicals that are built around a personality. 
Um, the structure is Gypsy's this whirling dervish, and she's going to go. You know, Mama Rose is going to go, and everyone's reacting to what she's going to do next. Um, and so uh, that's, that's how I'm sort of uh, uh, approaching, approaching Hamilton, is, is this guy's going to go whether you're with him or you're not. And, and, and it's both inspiring and terrifying and intimidating to, to all of the other opposing forces in his life. We are out of time. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I know. Oh, you can oh, ask oh, afterwards. Oh, all right, all right. I'll answer real fast. Thank you. <laughs> um, as another... Um, former teacher turned starving writer. Um, <laughs> what, um, how, how are you currently, or how would you like to be uh, helping other early career artists move into the field? And uh, sort of as a corollary to that, um, do you think there's a best way to do that? There's no shortcut for writing. You know, I, I, I am, uh, because I never got enough hugs as a child, I'm quite addicted to Twitter. Um, <laughs> It's an audience whenever I want, and um, and so I, I, you know, I get a lot of I get a lot of variations on that question, and 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 you have to write, and you have to write and write and write and write, and you will write through your bad stuff, and you will write through your good stuff, and you write your way back to bad stuff. But I, I, um, you got to have something to show, and, and I think that's the number one step. You know, people come up to me and they go, "I have this idea for a musical." It's like, well, you can't show me your idea. Um, you can show me your musical, and you can show me a, a demo of songs, um, but, but you know, I think um, I, I, what I love are things like this. You know, I've been attending panels all day. I, I, my brain is still uh, burning from John Weidman's writing history um, uh, seminar at 3 o'clock um, and, and listening to Therese Rebeck's stories of, of writing in Hollywood this morning. And so, you know, take solace in your fellow writers and, and find those, those like-minded souls. Um, I'm so grateful Steve Schwartz is, is sitting here who is, um, <laughs> you know, in addition to being the inspiration that he is, you know, when we were working on Heights, um, Alex Lackamore, our music director, was the conductor at Wicked. So I learned more about orchestrating by sitting in the pit at Wicked, which I did about 10 times, just sitting next to the guitarist, figuring out how, to, how a pit worked and figuring out how this amazing score uh, was spread across these instruments. Um, I, I, I owe him an invaluable debt for that uh, and a million other things. But um, you know, take solace in each other and have fun this weekend. Thanks for coming. Very cool. Lin-Manuel Miranda.